Hi, Anna Marie. It's good to see you today. Yay. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So tell the listeners a little bit about who you are, what you do. Yeah. So I am a doctor of traditional naturopathy. So if you go back 150 years, there were only people like me uh, playing with plant medicine and all the things. Um, I also am a certified brain health practitioner. So I really like to focus on holistic ways to build people's foundations of health to improve their mental health, physical health, and their energy field around them. And I use a whole host of fun modalities to do that. So I combine high-tech pieces of equipment with old school Chinese medicine and holistic health practices. And so it's it's definitely um, a variety of different therapies and uh, modalities I've learned over the years from healing my own brain. Oh, it sounds so interesting. One of the things I love about having a podcast is getting to learn more about things that like I'm very interested in, but don't have like a a firm grasp on yet. So I've got some (laughs) awesome questions for you. And can tell me a little bit like who comes to see you, you know, like if you're going to just paint me a picture of like an ideal kind of customer or client, what are they usually struggling with and why do they come to see you and what do you help them with? Yeah, so I get kind of a range, but um, so I should back up and say, I believe that any physical ailment that we have actually manifests in the body from some type of emotional blockage, um, either something we've inherited through lineage or something that's developed over time. I did not always think this way. Um, But through my own journey and working with clients over the years, it's really interesting because I see that. I find that there's a lot of anxiety um, with people. So I get a lot of people that have anxiety that come and see me and simultaneously they have issues with digestion and gut health. And um, so there's definitely these correlations between the physical ailments in the body and what emotionally someone's going through. Um, But yeah, I see all the way kids with ADHD to business executives, you know, running multi-million dollar businesses that want to keep their brain clear and have good health. But I would say the majority of my clients that come to see me have um, one either had some negative impact with Western medicine, it didn't work for them, um, or they're only being offered medication um, and they have things going on in the body and they wanna find a more holistic um, whole approach to support their health. And so then, um, they come to, you know, see what other ways and modalities they can use to support their health. Oh, well, I can't wait to learn a little more about that. And I love that. Like what I really hear from you is like, we're treating the cause, not just the symptom, you know, and the symptoms, yeah. like you just put a bandaid on over and over and again, and it doesn't really provide that lasting change or that cure, but like really looking at the symptom, whether like you say, it's this emotional blockage or, or something else that we just aren't aware of, I think is so critical. So how did you get involved in this work and kind of what's your backstory in, in being interested in, in both this like, um, kind of psychological approach to, to health and medicine? Yeah. So I like, if you were to look at my life and look at me, you would be like, Oh, she's happy. She's pretty, she's successful. All the things, which I am all those things. Right. Um, and I say that with confidence now, because before I would, I wouldn't say that, but, um, I struggled with depression since I was younger for essentially no apparent reason, right? Like you'd look at my life and you'd be like, oh, she's a good athlete. Oh, she's smart. She has friends, like all the things, but yet on the inside, I was like slowly dying inside. Um, and after high school, you know, go to college, struggle with depression there. And then when I entered adulthood, um, I hit probably my lowest low. And I was just always taught that you go see a doctor in a white coat and they will fix you. So that's what I did. I spent about 10, maybe 15 minutes with this doctor. Um, he wrote me a prescription for three mind altering medications without even scanning or looking at my brain. That's one thing I've learned over the years is the brain is the only organ in the body that doctors don't scan um, or really look at to, to see what's going on unless it's you know like Dr. Amen or you get a spec scan. Anyways, um, so what I do, I took the medication um, and I progressively got worse. And I was constantly looking outside myself to fix, quote unquote, my depression. 
And um, I ended up getting to the point where I was having thoughts of, oh, it'd probably just be like so much easier if I just like wasn't here, like life would be so much better. And, you know, having those intrusive thoughts. Um, and so I thought, oh, I better go back to the doctor and change my medication because I'm having these thoughts and, you know, all the things. And ultimately, I went back to that doctor a few times and I was pretty fortunate because there was some little light inside of me. And I know not everyone has this. That was like, wake up. Like you are the only person that can make yourself happy. This is not something outside of you. And I don't know where that came from, but it came from, I think the universe and God and all the sources. So I went on this journey to heal myself naturally because medication didn't work for me. Medication does work for some people, but it's not like this blanket approach and, and, so there, there, we need to find other alternative options, right? Or I think back and it's like, what would have happened if they took an approach with me and said, what is your stress level? How are you eating? Are you moving your body? What are your relationships like? What's your finances like, right? And looking at me as a whole human versus saying, oh yeah, you have depression. Oh, you have ADHD. You have this and that. You're dyslexic. It's like, really in 10 or 15 minutes, you're telling me I'm all these things. And so now I have this label on me. And so then, um, yeah, I just, I didn't want to be labeled anymore and I needed to heal myself. So I set forth on a journey and it was a long journey to get to where I'm at now. Um, but ultimately I do what I do now, um, because one, I know that I can help other people feel better, um, with some of these modalities. And I don't approach every person the same. And um, I think it's important that we have, have choices um, for our health. And, you know, these things took me time, but I can actually, I figured out different ways to help people a lot faster so they don't have to spend as much time I, as I did trying to fix myself. Um, so I, I kind of give them some hacks that help move the needle a lot quicker. Oh, and I can't wait to, to, to hear those. I'll, I'll ask about that in just a moment, but kind of peeling back to your story. I think it's so pivotal that you have this moment with this doctor for 15 minutes. Right. And, and again, as you said, it's not like a, you know, this huge proclamation that medication doesn't work or that it's not the right fit for someone, but like, that's really the system that we have right now is that you mm -hmm. get 15 minutes with like a, a so-called expert and they're not asking any of these questions. We just assume something's off in the brain chemistry and some kind of medication needs to fix it. Is something off in the brain chemistry because this person's never going outside? Are they not eating any nutritious foods? Are they not like working out? Are they, you know, all these kinds of things they're not even asked. And I think I see this too in children, like, again, not blanket statements, not like some people don't struggle with certain things. Of course they do. But I think right. even how we treat ADHD in children, like they have this nervous frenetic energy. Do they even get to play outside? Are they like inside all day with like a right. iPad or something like that? Like that makes a huge difference to a child and yeah. how they express their energy. So it's just crazy that like, we aren't given the care, I think as like a person, as you said, to, to ask those kinds of questions. Um, tell me, did alcohol play a role ever in this part of your journey? And like, <laughs> tell us a little bit about that. Oh, for sure. Um, you know, after reflecting back, this was really interesting. Um, I was an athlete in high school, so sports really, um, I couldn't go out partying and drinking and all that because I had a competition the next day or whatnot. But I will say I did start drinking in, I think around my sophomore year of high school, I would do like little binges, right? We'd bong beers and do all that stupid stuff. And, um, and knowing what I know now about the brain, because I have training from the Dr. Amen clinics, I'm like, oh my gosh, like my brain wasn't even fully developed and doing the, even if I was binging like once a month, that's still such a, a major impact on brain function and how your brain develops. So yes, I drank in high school. And then um, in college, I started drinking even more and I started getting more and more depressed. I was already feeling depressed in high school and I was drinking, um, but it wasn't as regularly as in college. And then I actually went to college in Michigan. And back then you could actually smoke in bars. So not only was I drinking in college, but I was getting secondhand smoke as well. And I just became more and more depressed. And um, I would drink to make myself feel pretty, to make myself feel like um, I was exciting. Um, I don't know, I would drink for just because people are going out to drink, right? Because that's just what you did. Um, and so I continued that through college. 
uh, made very bad decisions that I would never make sober. And then um, when I went into my career, I actually moved across the country. I left my entire family, moved across the country for a job and then um, continued that drinking and got into a very, very deep depression. And this was around 22, 23 years old. And um, that's when I, I pretty much hit my rock bottom. Yeah. I think it's so interesting because like, as I stopped drinking when I was 30 um, and between 25 and 30, I would just try to drink less. So my heaviest drinking was actually when I was younger, when I was around 21, 22, 23. And that was like the darkest hole of my life too. Like not only was the alcohol obviously part of that reason, right? And it's just like, there's there's no wonder now when you look back in hindsight, like obviously um, I felt so unsure of myself and sad and depressed and lost because alcohol. But also I think that time in your life is just, it's so hard. Like you, you just, you, you go from this adolescent to like, now I have a career and I have an, and I'm an, a, a true adult. And I think we think that everyone else has it all together. Everybody else is happy. Everybody else knows what they're doing. And we just feel so lost and alone, you know, and, and like that time in life, I think can be really hard and really, and heavy. So what did you do from there? Well, So I cleaned up my act quite a bit, but I still would find myself drinking, um, for like all the wrong reasons. And once I started to like stop drinking as much though, I would say I would go out and I would like limit myself to two or three beers, which is already too much. Um, and that's of course, you know, a glass of beer that is really two beers in one glass. <laughs> so let's be honest and say five to six beers, right? Um, I would wake up the next day and I would feel depressed. So I was literally somebody who was suffering from depression. And I don't want to say I had depression. I say I experienced depression because it's not for me to have. I don't want to have it. So I'm not going to own it. Um, but I was experiencing depression and every time I would drink, it would enhance that. And I would have more depression the next day. I would experience a lot more depression the next day. Um, and then it was like this vicious cycle. And so I got to the point where, um, I'm like, okay, I just can't drink because I just don't, it doesn't do anything for me. It only, it's only hurting me. Um, and so once I stopped drinking, I actually started to experience less depression. Um, and I started to work on nourishing all these different areas of my life and, um, eating differently, exercising, not for punishment, but for, because I wanted to, and because I, it felt nice. Um, and just doing a lot of different things, supplementation. We don't even realize like when we drink to like how it depletes the body. Um, so I just started to do a bunch of different things that would really support my brain health and my emotional health. Um, and then that really, really helped me, um, along the way. And, um, and then I got pregnant and then you can't drink when you're pregnant, which is like, great. (laughs) So, um, but yeah, but what's interesting is after I had my son, my first child, um, I had postpartum depression really, really bad. So here I am at, I think it was like 27 when I had him, I have a history of depression, a history of, I would say it's heavy drinking. I, I mean, we put labels on all this, like, was I an alcoholic? I don't know. The bottom line is I was drinking to essentially change how I felt and I was drinking way too much. Um, and that impacted my brain because I was doing that before my brain was even fully developed and then having a child and then having severe postpartum depression. Um, I feel like, you know, all those past injuries, cause drinking too much binge drinking is an injury to your brain, not only to your body, but to your brain. I view it that way. So all those binges I had over the years just essentially crippled me for when one of the biggest moments of my life, having a child that is a physically, emotionally, energetically draining, exciting, all the things under the sun process that your body goes through. And if you're doing that from a space of already lacking nutrients, lacking, you know, um, the mental capacity, um, it just really 
enhances things for you. And, and that's exactly what happened to me because with my daughter, um, I had a little bit of postpartum, but not to the extent of my son. And between that pregnancy is when like, I was not drinking. I was like getting my health and my brain and like all of that in order. And it made a huge difference. Cause you would think that, you know, going from one kid to two would be like rocking your world, but it was actually easier for me, which mm -hmm. is kind of crazy. I love how you like share so many vulnerable parts of just like a woman's story that like are usually just really not talked about, you know, like people suffering from postpartum depression. Obviously now I think there's so much more discussion around it and communities out there, but like I've had even friends go through it and it's just like, what hit me? Like, you know, and you just have no idea and it's not something that's really we're not prepared for it, you know? And, and then, like you said, like all the other aftermath of the other stuff, like obviously also wasn't helping, um, yeah. going back a little bit into, you know, I like what you said that like depression was a, you know, something you experienced and not like I am depressed or I was depressed or something. So I think labels really do matter in that sense. And, mm -hmm. and obviously I'm not really fond of like, I am an alcoholic, like, no, drinking or heavy drinking is just a pattern you had. You could change that pattern. Right. Right. And same thing with like depression, depression was a pattern you had, or, uh, you know, something you experienced, but like, it's not a doomsday sentence that you have forever. Um, mm -hmm. so I think it's really important that you talk about it like that, because obviously for some people, a label like that might be really comforting. Like finally something explains me, but I think right. for many other people, it's like this box that we're now locked into for the rest of our lives. And it's not very positive. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. I don't believe depression should be a diagnosis. It's not there. It's not a root cause. There's something else going on that's deeper. And I think it's important we get to the root cause, right? So giving someone a diagnosis and, um, up for a symptom is, is that's crazy. Right. So, um, yeah, just not owning, owning that label was really powerful because I will say for a while I owned it. I was like, Oh, I'm so depressed. And I was like a victim. And I literally played the part for a while. Like I would always complain to my friends, everything's so wrong. Oh, I'm on antidepressants, blah, blah. Like, I think back to that person and I'm just like, it's like, Oh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just so glad I'm not there. Um, and being at the space that I'm in now, it's like, it's almost like, I'm just like, it was just such a silly, silly thing, but it was so real. It was so real for me. Right. Like, and going back to, um, like all the moms out there, like, here's the thing about postpartum. Most people don't talk about it. And then what is such crap is like, Oh, being a parent, it's like the best thing. And like, you're supposed to like this whole Instagram life of like moms with like the perfect bodies, the perfect kids, the perfect clothes. And then they have their, their glass of wine. They're like, Oh, just have a glass of wine. It's like, no, I can't like, I can't do that because I have to function the next day. Right. Like I want to feel good the next day. And I think it's so we should be pushing like for new moms to be like, okay, girl, turn on a good song, dance for five minutes, get those endorphins ready. It's okay if you can't hit the gym, right? Like drink some water, um, you know, all, I mean, I don't know. So like all the things, but it's like with social media and I'm so glad, like when I had my kids, social media is not what it is today. Um, because that comparing, um, you know, how we compare ourselves to others and just like, already being a mom is so hard. And then to have this like life portrayed out there on social media that like, yay, you know, you just carry your baby around, like they're another accessory. And then you have your, you know, your glass of rosé and all that. It's like, like enough's enough. Like this isn't like real life. Real life is like, you know, the, I, I'll give you real life. First time I was going to go out with my husband on a lunch date after having my son, my best friend was with me and I had put on this new velour suit, a little bit stretchy, you know, cause you have a baby and your belly's still sticking out and all the things, whatever though. But I straightened my hair, girl. I put my makeup on, I put a little lip gloss on and I was like, I was feeling good. A shower can do so much for us. And, um, anyway, so I was getting my, give, you know, changing my son right before I was getting ready to take off to go meet my husband for lunch. And literally I was pulling his legs up to wipe his butt 
And those of you that are moms out there, you know what I'm talking about. And literally he sharded up my velour suit <laughs> in my, in my like all over me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is like, this is real life, you know, like this is the stuff. And so then I had to like change and all the things, but you know, it's like stuff like that. People don't, they don't talk about that. And it was, and it took everything in me to shower to straighten my hair, to put makeup on. And I felt so good after I did it, but getting myself to the point where I could, where I physically did that to leave my home after having my son, that was like, literally that felt like running a marathon. It felt so hard to do that. But once I did it, it was like, okay, I can do this again. Like it felt easier, you know? And I think that's the thing is like getting your girlfriends just to like, do something for themselves when they're a new mom and not, Hey, here's a bottle of wine. Like, I know that's judgmental when I say that, but like, honestly, like, I feel like we don't all need that. (laughs) Well, I mean, and then the thing is, is that like, you know, obviously people drink out there and people will continue to drink and it's not like, you know, everyone has their own lifestyle choices, but like the mommy needs wine is literally like a a marketing message constructed by the market, by the alcohol industry to target the most vulnerable, stressed out people that have the least support in their, in their lives at specific time. It is like insidious. It really, I think is like morally wrong. And then like, it's just put, you know, reshared and just like made to be this like funny trope. It's so superficial. Like this woman needs so much. She needs so much. And it's not that like, it's just ridiculous. And totally pisses me off too, but, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, going into like now, like, you know, you, you, you share this journey of, of really kind of recognizing that it's only going to be you that is going to help yourself. And it's, mm-hmm. it's not going to be like some medicine or some, you know, white coat that saves you type of a thing. Um, you, you mentioned already some of the modalities that you work in and that you, you know, are interested in. So what did start working and you can obviously share some of the common sense stuff, you know, but what are some of the more like uh, interesting modalities that you find really helped heal that root cause instead of just the symptom? I think the biggest thing for me, um, was changing my mindset and looking for the good in each day. This may sound simple, but I think we forget to do it, right? Like if we sit here and look for injustice, injustice will be all around us. If we sit here and look for love and light and compassion, it'll be here for us. So I started to really pay attention to what I was choosing. Um, I was choosing to look for the negative, right? So I would find the negative. But then once I started to choose to look for what was good and working in my life, um, that started to arrive for me and it was there for me every single time. Um, the other thing is I essentially like, I had to take my power back because I kept going outside of myself, um, with alcohol, with men, with success finances. Like I kept going outside of myself to find things that would make me feel happy. And what I realized is like, I'm the only person that can do that. And so it's actually choosing to, really decide that like you are going to stand in your truth and own who you are and not be ashamed of what you've been through, where you've come from, um, and not use your past to keep you crippled into your current situation. And so just doing all this mindset shift, um, shifting, it was like super, super powerful for me. And it is something that it takes a lot of work to get started, but once you start doing it, it's incredible what is possible. Like a perfect example is like for anyone out there, if you're saying, I have to do this, I have to do that. Shifting that I have to, to I'm choosing to do this. I'm choosing to do that. Um, Because that gives you like your power back, right? And the biggest thing when you feel, or at least for me, when I felt depressed, it was like, I felt like I had no power. I felt like nobody cared to be around me. Nobody wanted to hear me. And, and that may have been true because I was like negative and depressed. Right. But I had to, and I didn't even want to be around me. Right. So I had to change what was going on within me. So things around me could change. So I had to start changing the way I was speaking to myself um, because our thoughts and our words are so powerful. They literally program ourselves, which is a whole nother podcast. Um, So that was first and foremost, one of the biggest things that I had to do. Um, I also had to let go of this idea that I had to be perfect. 
um, that I had to look a certain way, that I had to act a certain way, um, that I had to have certain things at a certain age. Um, so letting go um, was also another a big piece of that. And then um, really starting to work on like my nutrition and supplementation. Um, and that's how I ended up down the road. Um, I ended up creating my own line of brain nutraceuticals because I was buying like 50,000 things because I would be advertised to buy this, buy that, do this to make you happy, blah, blah, blah. And so what I started to do is um, after some training with the Dr. Eamon clinics and doing my own research, I started to say, okay, what agents are out there that can better support my brain and my biology for someone who has a tendency to feel depressed um, and someone who has a tendency to experience anxiousness, um, someone who has a tendency to experience brain fog. So that's when I went in and started to essentially take multiple agents and make them into one product to support someone. Um, so that was a piece because um, financially it was stressing me out to spend all this money on all these different products <laughs> and that caused stress. So limiting your stress, getting more efficient with what works for you, shifting that mindset, um, all of those are really positive things that you can do. And then I think the, another big aspect, and here's the thing I keep, it's never just one thing. So when I work with clients, like everyone wants to know what's the one thing I'm like, well, I'm really going to disappoint you because you're going to have to do a bunch of little things over time that are going to compound the biggest difference in your life, right? The biggest gains. Um, but I had to change who I was allowing into my life. That was a big piece. I had to change the conversations that I were, I was allowing to take place right? Like the neg negative conversations, complaining, the bitching, all those, all those things that tend to happen when people are at a low vibration and that are not happy. And um, so taking those out of my life was, was also very, very important. So it was like a combination of all these things. And then years ago, I started to learn more about meditation. I started to learn about red light therapy. I started to learn about sauna therapy. And there's all these little hacks that you can do to essentially hack your biology. And so I started to do those things. And those are some therapies that I offer at my center. Um, so that was more of like the physical hacks um, that you could do. So not only was I doing the mental hacks, I was doing the physical hacks. And then um, now a big piece of this puzzle is also the energetics. And I had no idea about energy. And there's this thing actually called being homeolateral, which is really interesting. Um, I would say 99.9% .9 of people that are depressed that I see, I test them to see if they're homeolateral and they are. And there's this essentially two to three minute exercise you can do that can take you out of that state and you feel better. It's incredible. Um, so just like learning little hacks and things like that, and just adding them in over time. But, um, yeah, I can't just give you like one thing. <laughs> well, I love the honesty there because it's like not one secret pill, but at the same time, like a lot of that mindset work, it sounds so deep and it sounds so, um, just like, Oh my God, where would I start? You know, but like a lot of the things you talk about is work that I've done. I do work like that with my clients. And so, you know, whether you want to work with a coach or, you know, maybe a therapist, but also the books, you know, there's so many yeah. books and podcasts that are talking about this kind of work that you can do and just familiarizing yourself with it and maybe exercises or practices to change your thinking. Like I have a completely different mindset than I did five years ago. Like that was a different person. She thought totally. completely differently. Mm -hmm. And I think like when we look at successful people or people we admire, like they think in a different way than people who maybe aren't as successful or don't have the life that they yeah. want. Like it's a completely different thought process mm -hmm. and just learning about how to step into that always a work in progress. You know, it's yeah. just, it really can change everything. Yeah. Um, I used to feel like I used to feel so ungrateful with my life because I wasn't farther enough in my life compared totally. to other people. And then it's like, you stop and look and we're like living in a world that doesn't have civil wars and we have enough food <laughs> in our fridge, it's just like everything we have, it's magical and you just have to yeah. change how you see it. So tell me a little bit more about those physical hacks. Cause I think it's interesting. It's like, 
it's, there's a lot of work, there's a lot of foundation work to do, but then there's kind of that fun stuff that can really help and improve and just really feel good as well. Uh, tell me a little bit more about like sauna use. I really love the sauna myself. Um, I have an appointment tomorrow. Like I know yeah. it's, it helps reduce cardiovascular disease, but tell us a little bit about like what you, what you think the benefits are and how people could start using those. Yeah. So, I mean, um, we have this medical grade sauna here, so it has infrared far mid and near light, but at the end of the day, what's really awesome about it is if I were to like bottom line it, you literally go in this heat box. And then the moment you step out and you like it, you cool down and you feel better automatically, you get a boost of like serotonin and dopamine. Like you're forcing your brain to do that. Um, which is really cool. But when you're in there, you're, you know, getting your vascular system flowing, you're actually sweating out more serum and it's detoxing the body. A lot of times, a lot of us can be very toxic and there's five main detoxification pathways in the body. And it's super important that they're all open. So you have your lymphatic system, which is through essentially vibration is how your, your lymphatic system reduces waste. Um, so if you have like a vibration plate or if you jog or run or, you know, anything that's going to vibrate the body, um, then you have your urinary, your bowels. Um, a lot of people that, um, have depression. Um, well, I've, my, I'll talk for my clients. They can tend to have issues with, um, more hard stools. So they're backed up, they're stuck. And then what's interesting is my clients that have a lot of anxiousness and worry, their bowels seem to be a lot looser. Um, and then there's also your breathing, right? So we actually can lose more weight through breath, <laughs> which is kind of crazy, but breathing is a detoxification pathway. And then our skin through sweating. So if you're not getting your heart rate up, if you're not sweating, if you're not moving your body, if you're not you know, your bowels and are moving properly, there is, you know, you cannot feel well, right? So the sauna is like a great way to hack that, right? You're getting your breath up, you're actually sweating. Um, hopefully your place, if they have a vibe plate or some vibration plate there before you, we have one before you get in our sauna um, or just jump up and down like, you know, 10 times to get that lymphatic system moving. Yeah. I have a rebounder. <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah. How fun is that? So and that's a trampoline for anyone who doesn't know that word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no sauna uses it's, I always feel so good after, after going in the sauna for sure. Um, and then tell me a little bit about red light therapy. So that's something I'm not as familiar with. Yeah. So, um, our red light bed that we use is pretty cool. So there's a difference between infrared and red light. So people get that mixed up. Um, red light therapy, about 10 minutes of it actually has been shown to increase serotonin in the brain. Um, also activates mitochondria function. So if you think about your cells, um, think about those mitochondria as like the little batteries in every cell and you're like charging them up. Um, and then when people go in our full body red light bed, we actually give them this guided meditation headset that they put on. So while they're in there and they're getting the whole physical aspect benefit of the red light, they're also getting that moment to go into a deep meditation to have that mind, body, spirit connection, um, which is pretty much all of our therapies. We I'm like notorious for adding. I'm like, okay, what can I add on that will one, save people time two not interfere with the main objective of this therapy and three, just make people feel super special. Like they're getting like the most bang for their buck. Um, and so I'm always like figuring ways to add on little hacks, um, at the center, which is, you know, I know my clients love it for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That was super cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And um, where's your center located in case anyone is local? Yeah, so we're in Bakersfield, California. And then we also have another location in Raleigh, North Carolina. Oh, awesome. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I think we dispelled like a lot of, you know, conventional thinking, you know, and obviously too, like anyone can form their own opinions and have their own viewpoints on things like this, but I'm just, I'm happy to talk with people who found something that really works for them and the people that they serve, you know, and, and there's just so much of that holistic piece, I think, missing from conventional medicine, and especially when it comes to uh, our mental health, you know, there's a lot we don't understand. And yeah. I, I love that you're, we're trained in working with one of the like four leaders of brain science, um, Daniel Ammon. Can you tell us a little bit? I know that he uh, is one of like those really 
he's really vocal right now, at least about like the dangers of moderate drinker to the brain, to the brain. Yeah. And like, the, like a long time, doctors were not saying that doctors were like, yes, have a glass of day. It's perfectly <laughs> great. It's healthy. Do you know a little bit more about like, uh, about that and the brain function and just from, from what you've learned from, from his perspective? Yeah. I mean, so Dr. Amen actually does what's called a spec scan. So there's no essentially speculating about what's going on in the brain when you have a spec scan. So it essentially measures the blood flow to all the areas of the brain. Um, when we drink, we decrease our blood flow to the brain, um, which is something that can happen. But over time, um, when you look at a spec scan, there's like, literally, it looks like, um, Swiss cheese, um, and I've had my brain scanned as well. Um, but when you have that Swiss cheese going on in the brain, depending on like, say you have temporal lobe Swiss cheese essentially going on, you can probably have issues with temper and anger. Um, you know, especially like football players, right. They've had hits to the head. A lot of times, um, frontal lobe, that's your executive function, decision-making that is lowered when you're drinking. Um, and so the thing about the brain is we don't even know how to like measure brain chemistry. Like everybody talks about brain chemistry, but it's like, okay, well, show me how we measure that. We can't, like we don't, right? And so what I love about Dr. Amen is he's saying, okay, spec imaging has been around for a very, very long time. And unfortunately, insurance doesn't cover it. So if insurance doesn't cover it, what do most people do? Oh, my insurance doesn't cover it. So then they don't do anything. It's like, wait a minute. Like we have been fed this whole thing about if your insurance doesn't cover it, then don't do it. Right. Like, I don't know. Anyways. So, um, insurance doesn't cover it. So it's not very commonly used, but yet there's all these psychiatrists all over that are prescribing medication for an organ, the brain they've never even scanned or looked at. Right. So I feel like that is essentially criminal. Right. So Dr. Amen is here saying, wait a minute, let's scan, let's look at the brain, let's see where the blood is flowing, what are these tendencies that are going on, and let's have a better idea of how to support this person, and he looks at holistically, and he looks at medication-wise, um, and so I just find him incredible for stepping up and speaking out about, about that, because it's very, very important. Yes, me too, uh, definitely a big hero of mine, and if anyone's reading my book, Euphoric, you'll find his um, ANTS framework in there. So it's oh, yeah. automatic negative thoughts. Um, I actually sent him my book and he shared it on Instagram. So I was so touched. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, Anna Marie, this has been like, I'm like taking notes. I just love learning from you and I love your perspective and your story so much. But, you know, if a listener wants to learn more about you, work with you, find you, follow you, all those things, where can people find you? Yeah, you can go to happyholeyou.com or you can find on Instagram at happyholeyou. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me.